all we can do is try to publicize the facts, not what the government's saying, but the facts, and not simply parrot or regurgitate what the government is saying, because that's largely bullshit. It was the dead of winter. I don't remember it ever being so cold. And we were on a mission. A bunch of us had volunteered to drive our good friend to his new home, the Schoolkill Federal Prison in the middle of Pennsylvania. He called himself fiber optic, and you'd have to look pretty hard to find someone who didn't think he was brilliant. Before we left, we had one night of fun on the streets of Philadelphia in the middle of an ice storm. Fiber learned by exploring, and was never too busy to explain how something worked to anyone who was interested. I think that's what must have pissed off the authorities more than anything. You see, they never even tried to prove that fiber optic hacked into any computers. They got him for conspiracy, for talking to people on a tapped phone line about how to hack certain sites. There were people who actually broke into systems and really fucked things up, and they never even got arrested. The feds didn't care. They wanted to shut down the teachers, the people who didn't know to keep secrets. There's Bernie S. He's another one of those guys who loves to explain how technology works to anyone who's interested. He didn't know it, but hell was just around the corner waiting for him. We made one last stop before we dropped Fiber off. It was a town called Frackville, which we thought was funny because there was a hacker newsletter called Frack. We thought it would make a good picture for the rest of the hacker community. But Bernie S. actually had the balls to get a Frackville cop to pose with Fiber. These guys had no clue what was going on, but they quickly got into the spirit. It was the last time we laughed that night. We drove to the prison. It felt like it was 20 degrees below zero. We didn't know they'd throw him in the hole for the entire weekend, some kind of prison welcoming ceremony. And, like the gullible idiots we were, we figured we'd have a chance to say goodbye. We didn't. They grabbed him, and we had to run out of there to keep them from taking our camera. Fiber came home ten months later a hero, and everybody seemed to know that sending someone like that to prison was a big mistake. After it was over, we were pretty sure it wouldn't happen again. Were we ever wrong? Communication I've ever had to do. One, two, three, four, five. I just saw something. Was that was that you? I, well, we can see your hand. I, I doubt you can stick your whole head through the window. Yeah, but like like splash your face up against the window. Now we know it's the right one. We can at least like zoom in on it. Kevin Mitnick the world's most dangerous computer hacker. My regret about cyberpunk is talking about Kevin and how he was always eating and how he was overweight. And people have really gotten on my case about that. Uh, some guy came up to me at an Austin book thing and said, why did you go on and on about Kevin's weight? And he was right. I, I did that to the point of, to the point where it just wasn't tasteful, where it was just sort of just 
beating an issue that didn't need to be beaten. For a period after he was arrested, incarcerated, and released into a halfway house, I couldn't find a single article that talked about him without mentioning, uh, for example, his weight. And the real uh, fascination with Kevin's body and its relationship to technology uh, is one of the things that absolutely hooked me. And I found a number of articles in Time and Newsweek written by people, uh, in, and the New York Times written by people like Markoff and Joshua Quitner and, and so on. And they would say, Kevin was in a halfway house where he no longer touched a computer and lost 100 pounds, as if those two things were connected. 1988, the USA Today um, put his picture on the front page, morphed or superimposed with the image of Darth Vader. And I thought, this is a remarkable combination of two things, and it's really picking up on the idea of the dark side hacker. If ever there was someone who fit that description, it was Kevin. The mere mention of his name was enough to incur the wrath of the authorities. Over the years, his reputation grew, and so did the falsehoods. In numerous articles, Kevin was said to have broken into NORAD, harassed actress Christy McNichol, and turned his friends' home phones into pay phones. His beginning was on ham radio. And on ham radio, it's a, it's a close-knit community. A um, couple of, you know, dozen people at the most on a particular repeater or channel. And, you know, they would get into challenges. And, of course, you know, Mitnick would be the underdog. Let's challenge him. Let's do this and that. And when he met their challenges, then they'd start crying and screaming as if they were innocent victims of Kevin's. You know, this has been the case throughout. And then people would start unfairly using uh, uh, other contacts that they had. In one case, a uh, lieutenant, I think it was, or a commander in the LAPD. Um, you know, one, one ham radio operator who was a friend of him got him to write a letter saying that Kevin was interfering with LAPD communications. And all sorts of crazy things in his, in his past. Cyberpunk was published in 1991 by Katie Hefner and then-husband John Markoff and it relied almost entirely on the words of people who Kevin had had a falling out with, as well as those who didn't know him at all. Hafner and Markoff never talked to Kevin because he wanted to be paid for his time. But it really didn't take much to dispel the rumors. NORAD denied any break-ins. Christy McNichol had no idea she was being harassed. And no evidence ever surfaced of any payphone conversions. But none of this ever got printed. Kevin's name was enough to convict him, regardless of the actual evidence. And then there was Security Pacific. After being hired, Kevin had once again been terminated because of the stories that followed him. And this resulted in yet another Mitnick myth being born. There was a Newswire article um, coming out that stated that Security Pacific had, you know, lost billions of dollars or something in bad loans, which would have affected their stock price. And that was actually tracked down to some error that someone made in entering the information had nothing to do with it not being true or anything like that, but it was an error that someone made in entering the information. Well, immediately, because there were people, employees at Security Pacific, that knew Kevin Mitnick, including one ham radio operator, immediately that was attributed to Kevin Mitnick did this. And that's how that rumor spread. I'd seen this all before. Hackers were always getting blamed for things they didn't do. In many cases, for things that weren't even possible. It was obvious somebody had to set the record straight. Somebody who would command respect. Hackers break into government and business computers, stealing and destroying information, raiding bank accounts, running up credit card charges, extorting money by threats to unleash computer viruses. Whoa, hold on a second. What was this guy reading? The Weekly World News? Hackers don't steal and extort. They play with all kinds of things. Like those simplex locks in the FedEx boxes. In typical corporate brain power, FedEx uses the same combination on every Dropbox in the country. It's always fun to stick something really big in there. It couldn't possibly fit in the chute just to fuck with the guy. And hey, he got some cheap beer out of it too. If you go somewhere you're not supposed to be and bring something back to show people, that always struck me as being a whole lot like a panty raid. And you know, panty raids are are really in the, tradi the grandest tradition of this country to try to make your way in there, get the stuff, and get back out with it without getting your head cut off. Yeah, what we're doing here is uh, we're, we're talking on McDonald's, uh, the uh, external speaker for their drive through And what we're doing to do that is we have a modified ham radio, um, modified meaning it uh, transmits on frequencies other than the ones it was intended to transmit on. Uh, and in this case, it's that. 
standard business band frequencies. 154.6 megahertz seems to be the standard uh, McDonald's frequency. Hey, uh, the blonde, would you please kneel down for a second? <laughs> Could uh, one of you please take off your tops? We'll give you the food for free. Bastard, you better stop being smart. Here comes the manager. Oh, really? While corporate America would always be the playground of hackers, it was mostly about fun and exploration, not damage or profit. But try telling that to corporate America. Kevin Mitnick had already paid a heavy price for his curiosity. He had served a year and a half in 1988 for logging into DEC computers without authorization. By simply looking at the VMS operating system, DEC claimed he caused millions of dollars in damage, and he was sentenced as if he had caused that amount of physical damage. He was also held without bail, and they put him in solitary confinement for eight months because they thought he could do even more damage from the prison payphone. After his sentence, Kevin had to serve three years of supervised release, reporting to the authorities every month and being restricted in where he could go and what he could do. And he only had a few days to go when federal authorities decided he had violated the terms of his supervised release by associating with Louis DePayne and accessing someone's voicemail without permission. It was nothing, but it was enough. Knowing how the media and the court system would crucify him over any offense because he could start World War III from a payphone, Kevin decided to just walk away. I was devastated. We were never far away from each other. Uh, and how was he living on his own without his family to share things with? I, it was horrible. What kind of a life is this? He is not streetwise. He's a home person. Kevin managed to avoid attention. Then, on July 4, 1994, everything changed. A front page story in the New York Times turned Kevin Mitnick into a household word all over again. The evil looking picture, the mythical stories about breaking into NORAD computers and controlling all the telephones in California, even the Security Pacific news release tale was retold as fact. Nobody could figure out how the story made it onto the front page of the Times since there was nothing new in the story. But the author was no stranger. John Markov, who was quickly becoming a Mitnick expert without ever having met him. We looked at the story as an amusement back then. A bunch of us were putting together the first Hackers on Planet Earth conference that August. The story had gotten so big that we all walked around with Mitnick masks. They came here to the Hotel Pennsylvania by the hundreds. These usually anonymous creatures of the cyber world, better known as hackers, were holding a convention. Throughout that weekend, Kevin called in several times to say hi. We all wished he could be there, but we knew why he was running. One of the things Markov hadn't mentioned in his article was the eight months of solitary confinement. You know, the guy was in, in solitary confinement for eight months. Eight months. Think about it. I mean, I, I, that, would, that would definitely change a man to, to a, a several degree. You would run. You would not want that because it was eight months, not for anything he did, but because the judge was scared. And if you get someone who is that unaware of, of actually what he can do and thinks that he can destroy the world, if you have someone that has that much power over you who will put you in solitary confinement, you're going to run. It makes perfect sense to me. Um, I think it's part hype, part hysteria, part um, lack of understanding, and um, part fear. Solitary confinement means no books, no pencil, no paper, no company, nothing to do but stare at these small four walls. You would get out one hour a day, and that's it. Well, you know, he might whistle up some missile launch codes. You know, that's a big problem with hackers nowadays. They get a little pissed off and they launch some nukes by whistling, you know. Uh, the fear factor is just insane. Once or twice, or maybe more, I can't even remember, but they didn't even bring him down to the visitor's room. They took my daughter and I upstairs to a, um, a floor that wasn't occupied at that time. We were the only ones there and the guard. They were hovering over him as though he was an absolute monster. What could he possibly do? You know, could, could he make a, um, a computer out of the telephone? Or uh, I don't know what they were afraid of. First of all, he had no desire to. Secondly, it wouldn't have accomplished anything. Thirdly, he couldn't do it. 
Kevin managed to elude the authorities into the next year. Then, on February 15, 1995, they found him in Raleigh, North Carolina. The FBI's most wanted computer hacker is behind bars. Kevin Mitnick was jailed without bond in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he was arrested this week. He's accused of breaking into corporate computers nationwide. Private computer experts say so many other hackers are at work that privacy is virtually impossible. The FBI had managed to track Kevin with the help of a mysterious computer expert, Sutomo Shimamura, who, along with some friends, had managed to track Kevin's cellular phone signal to the apartment he was staying in. One of Shimamura's friends who was there while the cellular signal was being traced was none other than John Markoff, who wrote an even bigger front page story this time. Sure enough, I opened the door the next day to the hotel room and there was the Times outside the door and I picked it up and I just thought, oh my God. This article had a whole new list of things that Kevin had supposedly done, including breaking into Shimamura's ultra-secure computer, leaving nasty voicemail messages, and stealing 20,000 credit card numbers, something that was mentioned in the first paragraph on the front page. But 13 paragraphs later on page D17, it was revealed that he had never used any of them. In fact, this was a list of credit card numbers that had been left lying around by internet service provider Netcom for almost a year. Netcom credit card file. Everybody had that file. If you didn't have that file, you were a loser. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people had that. They swapped it around like, uh, you know, bubblegum or something. And then they claim that he's the one that did it and he's the one that had it when that was floating around for months before he theoretically had it. Everybody and his sister's got a million credit card numbers. What's the big deal with credit card numbers? It's a meaningless thing to have. I mean, what I want to know is, you know, I mean, did he threaten anybody in any way? Did he claim he was going to do some particular set of harm? Are there, are there any notebooks that show that he had plans to, you know, conspire to commit any particular thing? I mean, other than humiliating Satomo Shimamura, which any idiot who's ever met Shimamura could have told him this was not the guy to mess with. And I mean, I met Shimamura once. The first time I met Shimamura it was in front of Congress. And I was testifying to a congressional subcommittee. And here's this guy in sandals and like ragged ass cutoffs. You know, and the rest of us are like done up and tied. And it's me and like the Attorney General from New Jersey. And we're sitting there and you know, and we're giving our best sort of yes, we're in front of Congress thing. And Shimamura is there and this you know, surfer gear, and he like pulls out this AT&T cell phone, pulls it out of the shrink wrap, finger hacks it, and starts monitoring phone calls going up and down Capitol Hill, while an <laughs> FBI agent is standing at his shoulder, listening to him. I'm like, this fucker's got balls the size of durian fruit. You know, this is unbelievable. This is the heaviest guy I've ever seen doing I mean, uh, he's hacking, right? I mean, he was, he was finger hacking this phone in front of Congress with two FBI agents and, the, and John Gage from Sun Microsystems in the room from him. I know, and I was like, wow, you know? I mean, I was impressed. Inside of a week, Shimamura and Markov had signed a book deal estimated to be worth three quarters of a million dollars. It would be another 19 months before Kevin would even be indicted. The book, entitled Takedown, was finished by the end of the year. I, I, when I read it, I was aghast. I, I was aghast. It was Sotumu's eating and skateboarding habits. I, I'd been to a lot of the restaurants he'd been to, but I don't think I needed a hacker book to tell me about them. Take down, well, <laughs> I, I don't know what I want to say about take down. <laughs> take down was not well received. 1996 came and went, as did 1997. Kevin remained in prison without even a bail hearing and no prospect of a trial anytime soon. A 25 count indictment accused him of nothing more serious than lying on the telephone about who he was and copying software which he never tried to sell or even distribute. Nothing about hacking into Shimamura's machine, nothing about having 20,000 credit card numbers, nothing that would have appeared in a John Markoff story. North Carolina had also charged him with making free cellular phone calls. Kevin was given a two-year sentence, more than he would have gotten from manslaughter, but the federal charges still remained. They even put him in solitary confinement again because the prison authorities convinced themselves that he was going to build a transmitter out of a Walkman, sneak into the warden's office, and monitor his conversations. The mainstream media made light of it, claiming Mitnick was put in solitary for having too many cans of tuna. What everyone seemed to forget was that years were going by, 
and this guy had yet to be tried. And then things got a whole lot worse. June 1998, a movie version of Takedown was announced. Skeet Ulrich, who played a killer in Scream, was set to play Kevin Mitnick, and Russell Wong from the Joy Luck Club would be Sutomo Shimamura. It didn't seem to matter to anyone that the real-life Kevin was still rotting in prison without a trial. According to the script we managed to get our hands on, he had been found guilty and sentenced already. The magic of Hollywood. They even brought Kevin and Sutomo closer. In real life, they had only met for a few seconds in the courtroom. In the Hollywood version, they met in a dark alleyway, where Kevin would proceed to bash Sutomo over the head with a garbage can lid. We had to tell the world that this was a big mistake. The truth needed to be told. And we could either do it ourselves or use the media. That's right, the media. Democracy's biggest allies, committed to informing the public no matter the cost, the true conscience of America. Don't yell at me, everyone's in front of me. Well, tell him to come back. He's coming to the mic. Coming to the mic. Gabe, Gabe, come back. Would you guys get down again? Gabe, come back. 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 Gabe, we decided to do it ourselves. So we found Skeet Ulrich's apartment in New York in an old phone book and paid a visit to try and get him the real story. But he had moved. I know, because the doorman let me look at every single name in the book. So the next stop was Miramax Films on the west side. We figured they'd appreciate a chance to correct all the mistakes in the screenplay. And we knew we'd be warmly received because, well, this was Miramax, the company that distributed Michael Moore's latest film. You know, the guy who films in everybody's lobby. Hey, have a gift for Miramax? Nice Miramax? Nice Miramax? Nice Miramax? Nice Miramax? Nice Sorry, you can't film in here. Can I film in here? No, it's a landmark. Sorry, you can't. Yeah, this is yeah. So there's no way you can call upstairs. No, there's no pictures to show here. Oh, yeah. 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 This wasn't going well. How could a movie company tell us to stop filming? All we wanted to do was talk to somebody. What a letdown. Well, his light is on, so he's capturing everything. So if you could please go outside before he has to call the police. All right. Well, we don't want that, so we'll, uh, we'll go outside and we called the office and waited to hear back from them, but we never did. It was like they were scared of us. Maybe they actually agreed with Bill Clinton that hackers were as one-dimensional as they were in this movie script. How could we get them to see the other side? That night, New York City introduced unlimited ride metro cards, and we decided to figure out how long it would take for our cards to reset so we could let people in for free. This is what the hacker world was really all about. Why didn't they see this? Why did it always have to be something evil to the people who didn't get it? We had only one option. Okay, for Off the Hook, I recently uh, heard the show where you guys received a copy of the script for Takedown. I found it to be really amusing how the script writers can take the truth and not twist it or fabricate it, but just plain lie about what happened. I've heard about Kevin's story and um... Thanks to Off the Hook, I heard about this meeting and uh, I decided to come and uh, see what I can do to help. It wasn't from me, it was from somebody else, but I knew exactly who that. Is there a good catchiness? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From Supermax to Miramax. Three and a half years with no trial. And then you can make another one from Miramax to Supermax. And no trial. When they see two free Kevin stickers, when they see 10, 20, 100, they're going to say, who the hell is Kevin? And they're going to keep saying it until somebody answers them. One or two people that know more about it are one or two people more on our side. Those two people get two people, we get two people, you know how it works. Yeah, Basically, yeah, we're going to be in their face every step of the way. And if it comes to showing this thing in the screen, you know, in theaters, we're going to be there too. I mean, what we're doing now isn't going to be finished until Kevin has his trial, until Kevin's out. Uh, guilty by Hollywood or something like oh, that's that. A good one. Wow, that's good. Yeah, I like that's that. Um, yeah, I, I did look at the script and uh, 
I don't know. Uh, it, it's a shame, and uh, it definitely shouldn't uh, be something out there uh, for someone who knows very little about Kevin to then see this movie and have ideas in their head that, that are untrue. We had tried talking to them, and they wouldn't listen. Now, by having a demonstration outside their offices, they would have to listen. But we were a bunch of hackers. What did we know about demonstrations? Just that they can turn into riots, especially when the mayor was banning demonstrations outside City Hall and the cops were shooting people a whole lot more. We needed guidance. Someone with experience. We looked all over town for an activist. Maybe one of those gray-haired hippies from the 60s. We found one. Sort of. <laughs> What's, what's it like demonstrating here? Did you get the harass? Well, they hate our guts because they don't want the truth to come out. Why do, you, why do you think there isn't more activism? Because people don't care, they're scared, they're afraid, they're afraid they'll get into trouble. I can understand it, you know, I mean, but uh, we still have to take a stand, afraid or not. We have to at least make, give it a try, we have to give it a shot, you know. Has uh, this cop been giving you any trouble? No, no, he's been standing there, he hasn't bothered me. And we have a president that wants to suck their brains out. That bothers a lot of people, but... Yeah, uh, yeah, it bothers... Uh, anybody that's decent gets bothered when a little child is tortured to death, you know? When a president's sucking their brains out. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't exactly what we had in mind. I got a real earful about the evils of homosexuals and communists. But in the end, he told us the one thing we needed to hear. When you demonstrate, make sure you're in the right. And that's the one thing we were sure of. We were right. They arrived. We had no idea what to expect. We just kind of stood there for a while, not knowing what to do. Our converted phone company van got more attention than we did. My name is Noah Kinnickstein. I'm an attorney. For Miramax? Or no, no. For oh, you I, all. I, I didn't even know. I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, a law, I'm, not from, I'm representing you all. Oh, okay, great. So Thank no you. one's getting arrested, right? I didn't plan on it. Good, good. The National Lawyers Guild actually sent someone to protect us, and that was the turning point. Things began to come together. Even members of the media started to show up. It seemed like everyone except Miramax was taking this seriously. We learned that when you stand outside a film studio's offices with picket signs, people notice. are going to put on a little demonstration here. They're going to be marching around. I thought I would tell you that you could tell the, tell the, precinct, tell the precinct and tell them, I'm a lawyer. It's nice and calm. No problems at all. Glad, but they're going to have a little debt and they're going to be marching around. So if you want to have, I, I'll have that. I want to just tell you that. I appreciate that very much. All right. Can you tell me approximately, sir, how many? I would say there's going to be maybe uh, 50, 50 people, Patty. 50 to 60, the maximum 50. Mac maximum 50. 60 people. What area are you doing it in? They're going to do it here in front of Miramax uh, Films. They're demonstrating about a movie that they're making. I see. Okay, okay. fine. I appreciate you stopping All me. Right. And, and I'll have the precinct nice consent. I'll tell them that, sir. Right. Thank you very much okay. for your advice. No, no they're not going to come on purpose. Like, people are, you know, you're talking about... You're talking about suits. They don't give a fuck. You gotta go hand it to them. Uh, don't harass the people that walk by. Some people, some people have crises going on in their lives. They can't be bothered with our problem. Y'all have a permit? Do y'all have a permit? Who's in charge out here? Do y'all have a permit? All right. As long as you don't block in front of the entrance, you stay to the side, please. Thank you. They can walk in front. Yeah, I guess so. They can walk in front. The cops have been As long notified. as you don't block the entrance for the people to come no, in, no, I don't have no problem. You're not have don't no block problem the entrance. First Amendment, right? Don't you're block the entrance. Block. That's all I'm saying. It's ringing. I got put in voicemail. I guess I got too many calls. It just went straight to voicemail. I'll leave a message there. Hi, this is a protest outside. Are you are you guys there? Uh, if you get this, come outside. We're right right down here. I see someone. All right. Well, maybe you'll pick up the phone and, or come downstairs later. So were you calling like the publicity department or something? No, I just called the main number. I got yeah, a, right. I got a hold of them yesterday. Oh yeah, really? And I asked for directions to the protest, and uh, they told me they couldn't get me from where I was at to here. And I said, okay, well I'll call you back tomorrow when I'm out front. And I see them. They, they yeah, both yeah, get their heads up. There's one. Yeah. 
But they're not answering the phones now. Waving banners that said free Kevin and holding stop Miramax posters, the small but vocal crowd of protesters stood outside Miramax Pictures' New York offices yesterday. At issue, this script entitled Takedown, the story of the nation's most notorious computer hacker, Kevin Mitnick. Mitnick is currently being held in prison without bail, awaiting trial on computer crimes. It's a script these Kevin Mitnick supporters say is libelous and would hurt Mitnick's chances of getting a fair trial. It might influence, influence the jury. It might, uh, it might change a lot of things in a, in a negative way. I mean, he's trying so hard to, to, get a, to, to at least get a trial, and then this comes up where he's constantly being defamed. You never know who you might see when you're standing outside the office of a film studio. Kevin Bacon had no interest whatsoever. The radio personality Laszlo did. With the prol proliferation of uh, news, TV news journalism like Primetime Live and these shows that completely distort the facts, um, and shows like 60 Minutes being forced to, you know, go in the same, same direction. Um, People don't know the facts about the case. They don't know the facts about hackers. Um, I, I say that hackers are the uh, are, are the communists of the 1990s. I mean, it, we're basically um, if anybody says hacker, all of a sudden you've got this demon 666 across your head. Nobody actually understands any of it. So what I do on in my part uh, on the radio with my syndicated show is try to get people to open their brains because I talk to a lot of old people out there because I'm on a lot of news talk stations. So when I can, I put uh, Manuel or Bernie S or anybody else on there to talk about the state of what's going on because nobody else is going to cover it. And the people that do cover it in the mainstream media are going to cover it for profit like the guy that wrote the book. The demonstrators here say they have sent a copy of this illicitly obtained script of the movie to Kevin Mitnick in jail and that he absolutely hates it. Miramax's parent Disney may not like it either. The controversy comes on the heels of the dumping of $43 million in Disney stock by the Texas Board of Education. The board's complaint that Miramax films have too much sex and violence. Miramax distorts the facts. 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 Was that Harvey Weinstein, president of Miramax? He walked right by us and didn't even get a stop Miramax brochure? Of course we had a brochure for Harvey. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> what did they say? They might, I don't know. They, they might come down. down. There she is. That's the one who answered the phone. She hung up on me yesterday. I got through. Yeah, they waved. Did you see them wave? They are alert. The door's the back. They said, you have to have use a bullhorn. You shove people's walkways. You have to have a permit. You want to come over. They are alert. The door's the back. I think that uh, for years it's a long time to be held uh, without actually having a trial. And uh, I think that what Miramax is doing is going to jeopardize his right to have a, uh, a free and honest trial. So that's why I'm out here protesting. Thank you. They all were aware of, of the, uh, the thing in front of the building in New York City. I mean, they were talking about it on the set. They asked me about it. They said, did you talk to Emmanuel? That's great. So they were waving at the window. They think it's fantastic. And they all want free Kevin stickers. The whole crew wants free I will send, if you give me some, I'll send them to them. They will put them on their cars. Hello, sir. You know who Kevin Mitnick is? No, I do not. Computer hacker who's been in jail for three and a half years without a trial. Miramax has decided to make a movie about him. Oh, really? The script is false. It makes him out to be a violent racist, right. which he is not. Want to know what you think about it? When, when are they doing the film? Well, they start shooting in a couple weeks. Kevin Mitnick is great. So how can I find they out should, about what's, they what's the truth? take him out of prison. Hold on, I want to talk to you. What's that? My main thing is, the only reason he even ended up like running to follow the law is because the people don't really have access to communications. All you got is like big corporations like Miramax with access to communications. First Amendment, yeah! <laughs> this is in America. This he was is happening in jail here. for three years without a trial. He's still in jail. Well, I saw this. I saw something about this on CNBC on Friday. But this happens a lot, though, because you always had those like unauthorized biographies, stuff like that. I mean, where it's like you have an autobiography, you have like authorized biographies. This is this different. Is, this though. is sort of like an unauthorized this biography, is gonna be but it's film. This not is going to be a He hasn't had a trial yet. Hasn't had a trial. So that's yet. sort of and not really. Wait, clear. not only that. In the movie, they already wrote that he had a trial. 
You ever hear of Kevin Mitnick? No, who's that? Well, if you're walking away, I really can't help. How did you guys get a hold of the script? Uh, okay. Come on. All right. Um, okay. Hey, you're a lawyer. Isn't it illegal to like, you know, if they're gonna slander him? Can't they? Can they try to stop him on legal grounds? Well, that's not right. They have to. They have to put a waiver or something. I think and that they, they should have to hold the film not... until after he's had a fair trial. Well, I mean, it happens. Happens, unfortunately. You know, I don't think it should be. Obviously, it's probably not legal. He'll have a, a lawsuit yeah, against Miramax. But I think they should have to wait until, until he's he had a fair him. trial. And in I don't think they should use his real name. Out. If they want to change the facts of the story, they should change the name and make it a fictional story. Three and a half years is a long time. Think about what you've done for the last three and a half years. And imagine being in jail while all that stuff was happening. Wow. For, for just for that, for just yeah. for copying software. Right. You know? I've copied software. <laughs> what did he do? Oh, he hacked. He hacked. So I just would like to know your opinion on uh, the, sl the slandering in this film. Uh, Miramax sucks. So, like, free Kevin. Well, you know. I can't, I can't like talk shit about a movie I haven't seen or read the script of, you know. Okay. But I guess the the one relevant thing that I could say is it seems to me there is a witch hunt, sort of hysterical mentality vis-a-vis -vis hacking, you know, and that people are very quick to fly off the handle and condemn, you know, as terrorists, people who are, you know, exploring like a new technology landscape yeah. in a way that they don't understand, you know. Definitely. That's sort of the, you know as far as I could go, not having seen it. Not only did we find a receptive bunch at the local theaters, they even started to do our work for us. New York was great, but it was only the start. We had to travel to get to the right people. So we put together a camera crew and made sure none of us had anything planned for the next several weeks. We charted out a course and headed to the airport. That's where we got our economy-sized rental car with unlimited mileage. The plan was to head down to Wilmington, North Carolina, where filming for Takedown was about to begin. On the way, we figured we'd make a detour and stop at DEF CON, the annual hacker convention in Las Vegas. And if we were going to do that, we really should stop in San Diego to say hi to Satomo Shimomura, and maybe convince him to stop using Kevin Mitnick as a cash cow. And if we did that, it would be rude not to visit John Markov to ask him to inject some accuracy into his stories about Kevin. And since we were suddenly adding 10,000 miles to this rental car, we might as well stop in on some of the corporations that were claiming Kevin Mitnick cost them millions of dollars in damages just to see what the hell they were talking about. There's something about Pennsylvania. I call it the prison state. It's because they seem to have prisons everywhere you look. And almost everyone I know who's gone to prison seems to wind up in Pennsylvania. Weird. Not only that, but every time I get pulled over by a cop, I seem to find myself in the prison state. I knew I'd better be careful. But let's not get off on the wrong foot here. Pennsylvania's a great place. Almost such landmarks as the Liberty Bell, Independence Hall, that little surveillance camera above Independence Hall, and the house where Thomas Jefferson signed the Declaration of Independence. And that's just down the block from the Afro-American Museum and its new neighbor. Well, gee, a maximum security federal prison right in the middle of Philadelphia. How times change. They say it's illegal to take pictures of any prison, even those under construction, even those right in the middle of a city. We couldn't find a law anywhere that backed this up, but just try and take a picture of a prison without getting threatened by some prison guard or cop. Here, look at this part. Maybe there are subtle details that will lead to a prison uprising someday. I think fully half of the people in federal prison, if not more, shouldn't be there. It's, it's not violent criminals. You know, drug crimes, somebody gets a mandatory 10 years for, for selling $800 worth of LSD. That's not right either. I mean, that's, that's the way the federal system works. It's, it's just not right. I know the state of California has more prisoners than, many, than South Africa. Incarceration is a big business. I think that's part of the reason. Um, there is less and less tolerance on the part of the public for people who transgress the rules. We have a huge prison population 
And th this gets into other questions. Putting a computer hacker in with sex offenders and murderers, I think, is probably the worst thing you could possibly do to somebody who has not murdered, not, is not a violent criminal. Who somebody who's a technological, who's gone over the edge, and then again, we we have to define what we mean. New classes. We need a new classification system for technological law. At one point in one of my books, I talked about setting up a set of a court system, especially for technology, where the people that were prosecuting and the judges and the people involved in the cases would have some technological basis by which, number one, to evaluate the case and try the case in a reasonable manner, and number two, to come up with an alternative sentencing system that reflected more of the nature of the crime. If you're exposed to people like that for too long, you just, you change with them. You become one of them. And then, you, you know, next thing you know, you'll be locked away again for doing what they do. One night, um, I was, uh, I was in my cell at, in the minimum security facility at Bucks County Prison. And two guards um, stormed in and flipped my bed upside down and started uh, and uh, and locked me in handcuffs and started rummaging through my uh, storage locker, demanding to know where my computer was. And I'm like, I don't have a computer here. What are you talking about? They were squeezing the toothpaste out of my tube, ostensibly looking for a computer or whatever they were looking for. It was it was bizarre. But Pennsylvania was more than just prisons. It was a place of learning. And the Age Expo was where thousands of senior citizens learned that corporate America really cared about them. I'm in that easy listening mode. E the guy representing Bell Atlantic was the most sincere of the bunch. How could you not trust a fox? Freddie, the phone fraud fox, was passing the corporate numbers around to the seniors, over $4 billion in phone fraud every year. Freddie said that most of that was because of evil computer hackers. And I met him. Freddie knew that words like digit would only confuse older people. It made more sense to say things like 10 number number. It means that they will have to dial the area code along with their seven digit number each time they place a call within and between 215-610 and the new 267 for 215 and the 484 for 610 area code. No, because you give them out in blocks of 10,000, and people that get these blocks of 10,000 end up using 300 numbers, and all the others are tied up wasted. Easy listening. Never mind the world outside. Easy listening. Found war and genocide. Easy listening. Forget the loop. We went back to a familiar place. Everything was just as we left it, only it was about 90 degrees warmer, but you could still feel the chill after four and a half years. It was kind of surprising how nobody tried to stop us from filming, so we filmed everything. The medium security facility, the minimum security prison camp, the sign that lets minimum security prisoners know when they've escaped, and Unicor, the local slave labor office where prisoners make furniture for the government for pennies a day. And we almost made it out. It was the first time we had ever gotten pulled over by prison cops. And how could we not drop in on our friends at CERT, the Computer Emergency Response Team? These are the guys who tell the world when there's a threat to computer networks. They back us up and tell the world that Kevin Mitnick posed no threat at all to NORAD, Christy McNichol, or the American way of life. We thought computer people worked odd hours, but these guys apparently took Saturdays off. So we asked the security guard to come down and let us leave a pamphlet or two. There must be something that gets triggered whenever you say Kevin Mitnick's name. We were meeting far too many cops in so brief a period of time, but at least Pennsylvania was living up to its name. We explained why we were there, but wound up getting the message we expected. You're not welcome. Okay. Um, in the oh, event, we're used to that. in the event that you should maybe happen to come again, 
if you are not welcome, and I find out that you are not welcome, you will be exactly where Kevin is. And then, so then you'd be defeating your purpose. Well, I'm here to do the job, but my job is right now is to get us out of here. Get you out of here. All right, well, I so that. I know a lot of people is in prison that probably shouldn't be there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's our judicial yeah. system. Sure. You know what I mean? Okay. That's what's in place. Sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. Yeah. And believe me, I've seen it not work in the favor of my people many, many times. I'm gonna go to parlay the rest of this my tattiest job is to okay. run you for wants and warrants and all that kind of stuff. Okay. If you would expedite your Leaving. Okay. We'll, we'll get out of here. We'll head to the border right away. Okay. We're, uh, One nine radio. One nine. Okay, gentlemen have been given a standard warning. Uh, I'll give you his name and stuff. Before we left, we decided to check the mood of the street. He told me not to mess with her. She um, did everybody she could in the weeds, and then she moved to the project. It's not Kevin's fault. Free Kevin. Kevin has nothing to do with it. The broad quit me because I was an alcoholic and I wasn't making no money. And um, I was broke. That's why she quit me. The reason I don't have a girlfriend is I don't have no money. Oh, well, um, he seems like a nice guy. Why would you want to do anything to him? You think his girlfriend's going to quit him or something? It was time to go. We were stealing potatoes back in World War II. And we was playing that rock and roll at the school for you know who. Hidden from the public, it was behind the scenes. There was a relic they called the purple hair. With Kevin Mitnick locked away, the phone companies of the world felt safe from any possible intruders. But the fact remained, lots of people were exploring all the time, online and off. Allied signal, aerospace, uh, more Sprint PCS up there. Informix, Southwestern Bell Mobile System. You're scaring me. Um, <laughs> it's like this, this flat area where there's like no trees or anything, just industry. Yep. Oklahoma, the state that created Hanson. People kept telling us our sound guy looked like one of the Hanson brothers. And since we happened to be going through their hometown of Tulsa, we figured we'd go to one of Tulsa's bustling malls and turn the Free Kevin campaign into a Hanson campaign. We could use the publicity, and if we could confuse some Tulsans in the process, all the better. And it sure wasn't hard to do that. Once we finished confusing people at the mall, we headed over to Oral Roberts University in the hopes that the religious right would climb on board. When the vice president of the university, a former federal agent, came down the stairs with a golf club, we took the hint. It wasn't a golf course for miles. They had a hard time getting into my place. Um, I had the bedroom door closed, so I did not hear their pounding on the door. And they were pounding on the door out there for a good 10 minutes or so. They actually even started calling on the cellular phone and leaving uh, messages on my answering machine. You know, this is the FBI, we're at your door, you know, open up. I wasn't there when they searched my house. My mom had to come get me from school. My dad was the only one home. They thought uh, 
that he was me. They were looking for somebody that was an adult. And when they found out that I was like 13, they just uh, they didn't know what to do. You know, I think if when they walk in and they want to take things, they should be told to go to hell, take what they want, we'll see you in court, don't even talk to me. And I think the problem, of course, is that hackers don't have the resources to do this. They want to try to get off cheap, so they cooperate and they plea bargain, and they end up pleading guilty to something they didn't do. Okay, and that sets the record bad for them going forward. I think if people had the resources or if there were an organization dedicated to helping people, to providing the resources, you know, um, something that's much more than just a, a dummy front, such as the EFF, an organization that's actually truly willing to help in those matters, that uh, we'd see a lot more progress along those lines. You know, the government for once would have to start conforming to the same laws that they're supposedly enforcing. We were detained for about two hours there in the parking lot. There were 13 police officers and I think five or six police cars. And uh, um, I told them what was going on, but they seemed to think there was more going on than there was. And uh, um, without my consent, they took my box of crystals, even though they admitted there they didn't know what they were. They took anything and everything that you know had magnetic media on it or had an electrical plug on it. They took other unrelated items, such as a woman's purse. I'm not quite sure how that fits into the scope of their investigation. Every business card I had, you know, everything. They took everything just to make life difficult on me. They told me they're not trying to chastise me. Uh, and then one of them said uh, he used to play with baseball cards when he was a kid or something. They would be searching my wardrobe. I'd be standing there with a the guy. He's asking me questions, and he's going through every pocket in my wardrobe. You know, then it suddenly dawned on me, I don't have to stand there. So I walked out of the room. He stopped searching the wardrobe and walked out, you know, with me. So it was very obvious. Their tactics weren't meant to actually accomplish something. So, you know, searching every pocket of every shirt in my, cl in my closet. That tactic wasn't meant to do anything except intimidate me. They showed up at my friend's house and uh, there was a three-year-old and a five-year-old who had just been put to bed and they came storming into the house with guns drawn and uh, ran up the steps and uh, said, free secret service, don't move. Of course, I was sitting at the keyboard of a computer, so it looked extremely dangerous. And uh, I was thrown to the floor, handcuffed and hogtied and all that, and uh, dragged out. I told uh, my uh, friend, Ellen Fisher, uh, who was there, to call my lawyer, which she did. Um, they kept telling me to shut up. Um, so uh, I was taken back to the police station there in, in Havertown, Pennsylvania, and, uh, locked in a cell for about three hours uh, while my car was searched and uh, then, uh, detect then a uh, Secret Service agent uh, interviewed me or interrogated me and wanted to know what I was doing with these crystals and I just said I was just making them available to people and um, he uh, tried to get me to say I was committing fraud with him which I was not but um, he got very irate that I wasn't telling him what he wanted to hear and eventually they just locked me back in the cell again and uh, they refused to let me call my lawyer, and uh, in fact, my rights weren't read to me either. Uh, there were several instances in which I told them I wanted to consult with my attorney, and they told me, no, that's not a good idea. They wouldn't let me get an attorney. So finally, when they all shifted from my apartment to searching my office, actually at work, I got to drive down in my own car. I called an attorney on the phone, and by the time they were at my work, so was an attorney. And uh, the agent in charge, Ken McGuire in particular, gave me a very nasty and disappointed look at the fact that I was willing to protect my rights. It's really amazing. He, he really gave me one of these, you know, you're bad, you shouldn't have done that looks, now you're really in for it. NASA people told my parents I was cocky because I told them to choose harder passwords. You know, I had cops, you know, tell me pretty well straight out that, well, you know, we, we really didn't want to harm Junior and so we just took his computer and we gave it to the boys over in traffic management and it was just really groovy and it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, you like, you like kid took this kid's equipment there? Well, actually it was his dad's, but you know, he was using it, but you know, dad should have known better. And so, you know, hey, this is what, $4,000 worth of equipment full of heaven only knows what content and you just sort of like pocketed it, basically. I mean, and you're not going to charge, well, you know, look, if we charge him, we got to bring him up under, you know, 14 different interstate laws, he's going to be a felon, he's going to be ruined. I mean, we explained this to them and they were like, oh yeah, take the machine, take the machine, please. 
But, you know, that's not legal. That's not, there's nothing like legality there. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's blackmail, basically. I mean, it's, it's like with anyone else. Simply because you have a badge or something doesn't give you the right to be an asshole. You know, unless you'd like me to be an asshole back to you. I, I don't care who you are. You, you will obtain the respect from me that you earn, period. I may have hacked NASA, but who doesn't? I mean, <laughs> it's... <laughs> They say they clocked us at just under 100 miles per hour on the interstate in New Mexico, and the cop wouldn't let us go until I gave him my social security number. And to make matters even worse, he told us we were still 11 hours away from Vegas. Things seemed pretty bleak. But then, a miracle happened. All right. All right. Yeah. Whoa. He said 11 hours, man. We made it in two and a half. Highway patrol people, they don't know what they're talking about. All right, Las Vegas, let's do it. Hi, we're looking for the DEF CON conference that's taking place now. It's supposed to be filming here. DEF CON yes. conference? Right. It's like computers, computer hackers. Not that I know of. Were they gonna were they gonna start inside the um, computer um, and work their way out or No, no, it's a huge it's about a thousand computer hackers coming here. I've never heard of it. Boy, they must have done a good job keeping They must this have they, they even got me going. Plaza Hotel, Las Vegas. Plaza Hotel, Las Vegas, New Mexico. New Mexico. It was a mistake anybody could have made. Except nobody else ever seems to have made it. But at least if we were still in New Mexico, we could stop by Los Alamos National Labs, home of well-guarded nuclear secrets, and one of the many places Shimamura had mysterious connections to. If we could get the word to the people here, we just might turn some heads. In those few places where we actually did get in, we always seem to stay a little too long, looking at all the things we weren't supposed to be looking at. This guy was mean and told us to get the hell out. And as we left, we noticed more of these weird guys in fatigues all around the building. That's when we got lost on a dark road with no name in the middle of New Mexico, with a bunch of military zealots surrounding us. We got the message. Well, when I started, I never intended it to last this long. I mean, I never thought, I thought it was going to be a party, and that was going to be it, a one-time deal. And when we left, everybody said, hey, are you going to do it again? And I said, well, yeah, I guess I could do this again. And since then, more people get involved, more people say, hey, how come, you know, we could probably have some music. 
So next thing you know, we've got a live laser light system with LCD wall projectors and DJs coming in from uh, the United Kingdom to spin. And so it's taken on this life of its own. We are the ghetto hackers. <laughs> the ghetto hackers. The ghetto hackers. Low class, low budget, high octane. my hand, proof positive that NT is not the solution to all your computing problems. I have here, captured earlier today on film, a blue screen of death at Las Vegas' own MGM Grand Hotel and Casino! Thousands showed up, and even though the free Kevin stickers turned into toys, at least everybody here knew his name. Kevin Mitnick? Oh man, you're gonna have to go to www.kevinmitnick.com, look it up for yourself. What he says about us, what matters is us. What matters is... <laughs> we were hot on the trail. I don't want to get into Shimamura, but yeah, I don't... I think he has a very large ego, and he's a very bright person, and he's very smart, but I think his uh, social skills need are lacking. For years, Shimamura had been eluding me. I couldn't even get on the same TV shows. He'd pop up over on CNN while I was stuck over on a broadcast network. And while he was getting all cozy with Tom Brokaw, I was being interrogated by Mike Wallace. Sutomo so wasn't even answering my email, but now there would be no escape. The San Diego Supercomputer Center, the place where he worked, we were closing in. You notice how, like, quiet it is, like, you know, when a deer's about to be killed by a lion? You're here to see him? Yes. Oh, okay. You're looking for Satomo? Yes. Haven't seen him in three months. Really? Yeah. No, I don't know. You know where he is? He's not here. Oh. Let me check with that. Because did, you, I... did you make arrangements to meet him here? Well, they weren't very firm, yeah. but he knew we were coming. Okay. Yeah, you know. You can try his office. Did oh, you have an appointment with him? Uh, it was very informal. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, we can try the extension, but I haven't seen him. Do I know him? Yeah. Well, just from interacting on, yeah, but um, I'm not, I can't. Definitely should have uh, called first, I guess. It's just, it's just he likes surprises so much. It's a sheet of paper that we wanted him to, uh, to have. I okay. don't know what it's about, and he wanted a couple of these stickers as well. He wanted these? Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure he got them. Okay. Great. Thanks very much for your help. It wasn't much better than the reception we got at Miramax, but we left our calling card in the place where we knew he'd see it. I think it's absurd when I find out that Shimamura, in addition, is giving instructions to Skeet Ulrich on how to act more like Kevin. Now here's someone instructing him how to act more like Kevin, and it's a person that met Kevin only once, in court, you know, under circumstances of duress. Now from there, how he can ascertain how Kevin acts, I don't know. When I step on this curb, we're officially on his property. Hi, sorry to bother you. Yeah. Uh, we're looking for somebody next door. We're not sure if we have the right neighborhood. Uh, Satomo Shimamura. Oh, he moved. He moved. Oh, he's long gone. Oh, well, yeah. how long ago did he move? Seven, eight months. Really? Give any idea where he went. No, he was renting, and the people who owned it moved back in. He's like in the national news. I don't know if you're aware of that. He's so, what? There's like a, a movie that they're making. Um, you can see I'm on the phone. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, they're making a movie about him. Who's, they're making a movie? Yeah. 
So, you know, it's all about... Um, I read his book. See, Shimamura. Yeah. Yeah, they're making this big Hollywood blockbuster about it. Okay. Yeah, they might even be filming around here because it's one of the places he lived. So I could be a star? You could be a star. I could be yeah. a star. I've been waiting to be discovered for a long time, yeah. He could be anywhere. He could be anywhere. Man, it's scary. We had one last address to try inside a gated community, but this was getting frustrating. Uh, we have another lead here. Um, we're certainly seeing a lot of the nicer places in this neighborhood. Out of order, please use out the door. Oh. You know, if that was a computer, we'd be facing 50 years in jail. I think we're the publisher's clearinghouse. It was like he was a step ahead of us. Japanese, long hair. Oh! For some reason, people think it's a good idea to have a full directory of every tenant in an apartment complex available to anyone in the world. But it gave us the definitive proof we needed. Shimamura wasn't here either. It's a pretty cool system, though. Let's try a couple other things. We're going to enter the um, the room number this time. I see now it's down. That's the whole phone number being broadcast there. Let's see if we get an answering machine. Hi, this is Amy. I'm sorry I'm unavailable to take your call right now. Let's see if there's a message and on the back to your back then. All right, I think we've pretty much gotten everything we can out of this place and made ourselves look pretty suspicious at the same time, so we better get out of here. On the way out of San Diego, our rental car broke. The trunk wouldn't close. You should get this tape off the trunk, too. Oh, oh. Holy fuck! Oh, my God! Oh, shit! We had to clean all the crap out so we could exchange it, including the disgusting piece of gum that somehow got stuck to the door. You know what? I'll use their own key to scrape it off. Okay, I'm down. This is like the most disgusting thing I've ever had to do in my life. You know, it's still soft. Oh, God. Want some gum? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a scary neighborhood. We made it to Los Angeles in a brand new rental car. Our first stop, the University of Southern California where Kevin had been accused of storing software from cellular phone companies. USC claimed that somehow caused over a thousand dollars in damage. I wanted to know what kind of computer system gets damaged by having files stored on it. Hi, I'm Brian Johnson. I'm the Associate Director of Customer Support. Yeah, we're, we're not allowed to comment on any of the security. Well, at least we finally managed to find someone who would say they weren't allowed to say anything. That was progress, right? The Metropolitan Detention Center in Los Angeles, where Kevin had been held for nearly three and a half years. It was his 35th birthday and we wanted to say hi. The closest we could come was the mobile station across the street. It turned out to be a popular place for all the people who couldn't visit their friends. So I know he's looking at me, so I just wave hi. Uh -huh. And he gives me a call and he says, oh, it's cool you went to see me. Yeah. He's comfortable with that. How often did you come by? Like almost once a week. Once a week? When I come and drop off my sister that go sees him. How come you can't go in there and visit? It's too strict, so I wouldn't know why. Why is the reason they don't let us go in? You're his brother? He's my brother-in-law, married brother -in -law. to my sister. So it's only immediate family? Yeah, so. immediate family, so I can't see him. I just uh -huh. talk to me through the phone and letters, and uh -huh. just, I just come and say hi. What's he in for? Um, I don't know. I don't know what, what, what was the reason why he's in, but he's just in. Uh-huh. Wow. And you, you bring your friends with you? Are they part of uh, your yeah. family too? Yeah, they, they know my brother-in-law, so yeah, we, all know we, we grew up together, so... Uh -huh. Have you heard of, uh, of Kevin Mitnick, the uh, person we're here for? No, I never heard of him. It's a computer hacker. Oh, yeah? Yeah, computer hackers are? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they, they, he's been in there for three and a half years. Three and a half years and hasn't had a trial yet. He, so that, that's no he should trial. get a trial, you know? Well, he's working on it, he's yeah. trying, but uh, the wheels of justice move very slowly. Yeah, that, that's something true. They, they're, they're, not, they're not the ones that are busting. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. There's so many people, I think. Uh -huh. It's overcrowded, I guess. I, I wouldn't even know what to say. I've never been in that system, so I wouldn't know. 
he must have when somebody's government's called up. He must piss somebody off. Yeah. <laughs> piss somebody in the off. government off pretty good, huh? They're probably laughing and saying, you have to stay there for a while. Yeah. That's not fair, but that's the way it is. When the windows are only a couple of inches wide, it's pretty hard to find the person you're looking for, even if you know exactly what time to look. And then we heard it. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. One, two, three. It's like shining with lighter. I can see him now. Was that was that you? That was you. You were you were pounding on the glass, right? Wow, we heard that across the street because we could we were looking at the wrong window. And we heard this like pounding noise. Come back to the window now and wave some more. Can you do that? We'll put a sticker up. We just don't want, uh, you know, the sticker to come back to haunt you or anything like that. You want us to put a sticker? Okay. You want the sticker? Yeah, the sticker would be cool. I, well, we can see your hand. I, I doubt you can stick your whole head through the window. Yeah, but, like, like splotch your face up against the window. Now that we know it's the right one, we can at least, like, zoom in on it. All right, cool. We'll see you in, like, what, two minutes? Okay, great. See you then. Bye. All right, he's going to be up there in two minutes. That was definitely him. I just wish we could go in there and see him, but I don't to resort to this, but oh, I'll take it. We later found out that our filming the prison had caused such a stir that every single prisoner was locked down, confined to their cell for the rest of the day. And Kevin told us it was the best time he had had in years. Like this. That's cool. Even the manager of the station said it was alright. This guy in the blue card just gave me six bucks for the first one. No kidding. Thanks. Thanks. That's great. That's but look where I put the sticker. I got the permission from, from the owner of the store. Put it right there? Yeah. It'll be gone tomorrow. Yeah, well, that's great. It'll be there for a while. He, he, he let you do that. Yes, yeah, I asked him. Randolph's going to get gas and he's going to fucking shit a brick. <laughs> He was never served with a warrant, uh, with a warrant for his arrest uh, for the supervised release violations during the period of a supervised release. So by the time that he was done and went on his way, uh, there is there's no indication that he was aware that such a warrant existed. Damn, this yes, fit really sucks. We wanted the entire city of Los Angeles to know about Kevin. And what better way than to put the message on the most famous billboard in town? It took us hours to climb that thing. We honestly didn't know there was a road that went straight up the back. But we made it. Funny thing though, we couldn't find anybody who saw a free Kevin banner. Later, we went to the most famous movie theater in town to try and spread the word from up close. Here, free Kevin. Free Kevin Mitnick. It won't bite you. Speak English? And we're trying to uh, get the message across to Merrimax that it's wrong to release a movie that's supposed to be factual, that are based on real events, that people are, people are going to see this movie and think this is the true story, when so much of it has just been completely fabricated. I've heard about this guy. Really? Here, help stop a movie about a computer hacker. You got a problem? Yeah, I got a problem. Come back and tell me about it. Oh, geez. But you know, I mean, it's hard to believe that someone in this country could be in jail for three and a half years, held in a maximum security facility, no bail, no trial. I don't find that very hard to believe. I read a book, Take Down. Take Down, that's right. I read like half of it. Even if you get someone in jail, you probably take over everything. That, that's the problem, is people think that, but it's not true. Well, you don't think you could hack on anything if you just get online? No, you can't hack on anything just by getting online. I mean, you gotta have a program or whatever. Why are you recording this? Hey, read about Kevin Mendick? They're making a movie about this guy. Uh, <laughs> it's the best guy ever. I know him since I was like, yeah, day you too, one. Yo. Man, my God. I need your love so fast. 
He's never done anything wrong. He's never hurt anyone. And he's being treated like that in this country. That is the American way. Wake up. Kevin was denied bail, you, you know, even a bail hearing. So if you recall, even Ted Kaczynski got a bail hearing. His bail was turned down, but he got a bail hearing. You're entitled to bail hearing. You know, on the other hand, Kevin is getting treatment that is outside the law. And that's what makes it very difficult for him to mount a legal defense. He's not being treated in a legal manner. I've never heard of anything even approaching this level of uh, confinement prior to a trial. Murderers get bail. Armed robbers get bail. And so the, the fear of what he's going to do from a push-button telephone in a general population of a cell shows, again, a lack of technical understanding on the part of the prison and judicial system. And I think that's sad. And he is right now the victim of that. On our way up the coast, we dropped in on Sun. According to a letter we got our hands on, they said Kevin's acquisition of their source code represented hundreds of millions of dollars in damage. Now they give the source code away for free. Something wasn't right. So we're right here um, on the other side of the freeway. There's the other Sun, which I believe you guys already saw. And then further up, this is their big campus, which basically all of, uh, all of I believe, this blank area is actually Sun buildings and Sun streets. We knew where we were. Now we just needed someone to talk to. Where, what number do we call and who do we speak to? 1-800-USA-FOR-SUN. And they can direct you to whoever you need them. USA for Sun? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you, you remember that or do you want me to write it down? The receptionist wouldn't let us talk to anyone unless we called that number, but we slipped some of our leaflets onto that coffee table. I thought she was being kind of patronizing. Do you want me to write that down or can you remember it? <laughs> I can remember it. Remember it, dear. USA for Sun, right? Is that it, or was yeah, it yeah. Sun for USA? Yeah, USA Fuck. for Sun. Sure? I have it in some way. Should I run in and ask her again? Okay. Thank you for calling Sun. I have a rotary phone. I'm not going to press any buttons. I'm pressing zero. I'm probably going to get hurt, too. <laughs> My call may be monitored. Oh, it's another machine. <sighs> they want my eight-digit ID number. This is bullshit, man. See, now they've got me waiting for a customer service representative. It's not exactly what I had in mind. <sighs> well, let's see what happens. My call is very important to them. He hung up. He hung up on me. I mean, maybe he didn't hang up on me, but he hung up all the same. Fuck. All right. All right, fine. I think on their webpage there was a direct public relations number. Okay, but we're not on their webpage. We're in their parking yeah, lot. That sucks. <laughs> so we can't. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Don't, don't you have your ricochet? You don't today. have your ricochet modem? Not today. You're not prepared, man. <laughs> Shit. We can't access the web from here. We're outside sun. We can't even get on the damn net to find out their phone number is. You know? All right, I'm gonna try this number one more time. I'm gonna be a little patient here. Assume maybe they made a little mistake. Okay, now I am waiting for the corporate switchboard. Uh, hi, Pete, uh, my name is Emmanuel. I'm trying to reach somebody in public relations and I'm hoping somebody can uh, can contact me concerning the uh, Kevin Mitnick case and how it involves Sun. We're doing a documentary. Uh, we came to the uh, corporate headquarters hoping to get an appointment, and they gave, it, gave us a phone number, and uh, we're trying to uh, do just that. So if you could get back to me, they have like a fortress here. They have that, that, mighty, that mighty guard there at the front that won't let anybody by, and then the voicemail guard here that won't let anybody actually call and speak to a person. So maybe they'll call back, maybe they won't. This is the red hotline. If that rings, we'll know. Okay. We have GPS, good. GPS, but no modem. Man, it sucks. That's true, though. Man, I was using it last night, and it was gone in the morning, which means... Yeah. Right, gentlemen, no cameras in front of the building. Yes. How about if we're filming up here? Uh, can't have any cameras filming. Okay. 
Wow, this was a new one. We couldn't even film ourselves in Sun's parking lot. Corporate paranoia was at an all-time high. And, needless to say, Pete never called us back. Meanwhile, John Markoff had agreed to talk to us. Maybe now we'd finally get some answers. We made it to San Francisco on the exact same day that psychologists from all over the world were gathering for a convention. Maybe it was because so many people in the Bay Area were depressed. I mean, they actually have counseling phones on the bridges because so many people are jumping off them. But San Francisco was a friendly town where people felt safe leaving their trash unattended. But more importantly, the psychologists wound up taking almost every hotel room in the entire city. Even the old-fashioned ones. We were beginning to get desperate. Then, we found a hotel that was almost completely deserted. We never did find out why. Mark Markov does things like mentions certain stories. He'll just say, you know, it's been said that, or, you know, other people have said that, this. And they'll come up with these stories like he shut down judges, uh, you know, TRW ratings, uh, you know, shut off power. It's bullshit. I don't think John Markov did it because he's, he wanted to destroy Kevin, but I think he did it to keep Kevin's evil image. Maybe he believed some of the things himself. He Okay, isn't a newspaper man supposed to investigate something before they pu publish it, before they put it in the newspaper as fact? I know Spencer Tracy and Clark, da Clark Gable always did. We didn't know what we were walking into. Would Markov tell us things about Kevin Mitnick that would shock and horrify us? Or would he realize how much his front page stories and books had demonized Kevin, helping to put him in the lousy place he was still in? This was our one chance to make a difference. And more than anything, we wanted to be fair. And so we came up with the Markov meter. We set a bar on his left and right side and resolved not to judge him badly until he said six bad or inaccurate things. And if he said six good things, well then, the hacker world would just have to deal with it. Maybe this wouldn't be so bad. Now there's an easy point for common courtesy. I wanted to get right to the heart of the matter. Like how they knew it was Kevin they were chasing in the first place. When I called the Qualcomm guys, they had been talking to the FBI, and the FBI believed that it was Kevin who had social engineered them. Why? Right. Um, what, I don't know enough about what's going on and what was going on inside the FBI investigation. Um, I, that's a good question. I, I don't know why. Um, but the FBI told the Qualcomm people that it was Kevin. And to my mind, as a reporter, it fit Kevin's M.O. Which is what? Um, social engineering. Really good social engineering. But there are thousands of hackers out there. Social that's engineering. True. That's true. That, that's true. That's true. I'm not saying it's proof. I'm simply saying the FBI believed it was Kevin. Did they yeah. hear a voice? Or did they have a voice recording? Or um, did they have a voice recording? That's a good question. What did they have? This we couldn't forgive. I mean, before you go and print front page stories about people eluding the authorities, shouldn't you have some real conclusive evidence? What did Kevin do that was different at one? Well, he had a reputation as being a very good social engineer. And, you know, I mean, I, I've heard some tapes, I've heard some people assert this. You know, I, uh, if, he in fact, if he in fact was the person who was at Qualcomm, um, then he was a good social engineer. Now that's better. No need to be stingy with the compliments, after all. Now, one thing that's been following Kevin Mitnick around since the first story Markov wrote about him is this myth about breaking into NORAD. When you say something like that enough times, people really start to believe it. And in Kevin's case, it really made him into a villain. So where did the NORAD stuff come from? The NORAD stuff uh, is stuff that I got from someone who was in legal trouble with Kevin early on. So I have not been able to interview Kevin face to face. I've heard he said that it's inaccurate, but I haven't been able to ask him. Um, the story did come from a friend of his. Um, I know there are lots of stories and Got to sort through it, man. Well, what what stories have stuck? I mean, with the Christy McNichol thing, people looked into that. That didn't stick. Nor uh, I think didn't stick. Security Pacific, I think, is probably um, one that stuck, but I think probably should stick. 
Uh, you know about that was in Cyber Department. Bank that he, uh, bank. he got a job at. That's right. And, and then they, there was letter and later a press release sent that suggested the bank was in financial trouble and they managed to keep it off the wire, but it almost went onto the wire. But what links that to Kevin? Um, the police investigators that we interviewed believe that it was Kevin. Based on what? Um, based on what? Um, just coincidence of things. Who else would do something like that? You've got to be kidding. You used who else to pin a crime on the guy? On the front page of the New York Times without even using the word allegedly anywhere? This was reported as fact, but it was never backed up. Just like NORAD, just like Christy McNichol, just like everything that made them want to catch Kevin so badly. Okay, let's look at the issue of solitary confinement. It was never mentioned in the front page article that Kevin had been locked in solitary for eight months and was desperate not to go back, and that this, above all, was what made him run. Yeah, I mean, he didn't want to go back to jail. Not just jail, solitary in confinement. Solitary. Was he in months. solitary before? This was his first time in solitary. Like after. 89. He spent eight months in solitary in 89. I didn't realize. Wait, wait a minute. He didn't spend eight months in prison. In, in, he was only in prison for six months in 89. You've written two books on the guy, as well as countless articles. You're seen as somewhat of an expert on Kevin Mitnick, and you didn't know he was in solitary confinement? Or even how long his sentence was? For the record, Mitnick spent a year in prison in 1988 eight months of which was in solitary confinement, plus another six months in the halfway house. It's a good thing those psychologists were in town so we could confirm that locking someone like Kevin in solitary was a pretty fucked up thing to do. I think it's inhumane, and I think that there are better ways to handle our problems. This is not, I mean, obviously, if this person has been able to do some of the things, apparently, that they think he was doing with the computer, he's very bright. That's a real talent that's being wasted. And to lock him up, especially in solitary confinement for eight months, that's, we wouldn't treat an animal that way. You know, and yet this is a talented individual. Excuse me. It's not right. Thank you. Thanks very much. He was in solitary the entire time he was at Lump A large amount of time. Really, eight months. months. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty hard. Okay, Markov gains a point for that show of humanity. Now, here's something interesting. When Kevin was on the run, he communicated with an Israeli hacker known as JSZ, who was believed to be the mastermind behind all the hacking that Kevin was blamed for. Yet, Markov never wrote a story about this person, and didn't even follow through when JSZ moved to New York. In fact, none of the authorities seemed to care either, almost as if these crimes were really trivial. Now that would be a great story, wouldn't it, John? I thought a lot about that, but I'm, you know, I just haven't had the time to, to do the recording. I mean, I've got a day-to-day -day beat out here and uh, you, you know you're right it's probably a great story I would love to talk to JSC and maybe I should come to New York and but that was a story that was going on back then JSC right. was was supposedly the mastermind behind everything and, and the conversation well, I never knew what the there. relations were the only thing I knew about the only thing I could say that I knew was that um, JSC and, and Kevin were actively trading information and software that's that's what I knew I knew nothing about masterminding I mean you know my if, I, if you asked me to reconstruct just from what I knew, it was um, JSC provided the tools and Kevin made the attack, but I have no idea if that's true. No idea? Isn't this what the entire book, series of articles, and now the film are supposedly based on? What Kevin actually did? I was amazed by what he didn't know. But there was more that he did know and had never talked about before. The one interesting thing that hasn't been made public um, you know, so much was made of the fact that the credit cards were never used. They were used. Um, an American Express card that was part of the Netcom collection was used in Raleigh within two days after Kevin was arrested. So, who used it? How did you find this out? I've just known it for a long time. So you're saying the credit card was used in Raleigh, and it's possibly a sec it was used after he was arrested? I think that there may be, there are some indications that there was someone that Kevin was in contact who knew about all of this and may have been active in it that was in the Raleigh area. I mean, all I'm saying is there's some evidence. How come this wasn't in the book? How come it wasn't in the book? It's a good question. I don't know why we didn't put it in the book. I really don't know. This was really getting annoying. He didn't follow up on what may have been the most interesting part of the story, and he didn't mention this little fact about the credit cards until now? One more remark like that, and it's all over for Markov. How many people are standing here and not one person took my brochure? Look at all these people. 
Not one of them took this. Valuable coupons. What are they doing now? Yeah. It's Kevin, oh, Kevin Mitnick. Mitnick. He's the computer wizard. Yeah. The way that the Japanese wizard found him was very interesting. Uh, uh, Mitnick respected the Japanese wizard for tracking him. On the other hand, since the whole computer business is stupid and ridiculous to begin with, why should Mitnick suffer for a, a, a ridiculous assault on culture, namely the computer? So that's it. What do you, what do you think of computers? I hate them. That's why? Um, because uh, they're not like um, feeling skin and they're not like walking in the forest. And, and one can get lost deeply in them. My son, of course, is in that world. Yeah, but I, I'm not computer I know, I know, it's all right, but see, he's a computer hackers, hackers are all right because they're because they're anarchists. I, that's fine. But the rest of us, you know, this is it's all bullshit. pornography. No. This is such bullshit. Right, no, no. I like Chaos Computer Club. I like anarchy. You know Chaos No, no, but I like the whole idea. Of it. It. I like the whole idea. Of it. Because no, no, it's great. But but no, Mitnick, it's ridiculous. I'm an activist. Uh, look at this, a bag full of artificial intelligence. They're from the 80s, but I still thought, uh, just to get back to my roots. Well, basically, it's like, you know, the government's making him look like the big... It's to create a hacker mythology so that they can deprive other people of, you know, privacy and other stuff like that. And he hasn't done anything wrong, you know. He hasn't even done any financial damage to anybody. It's basically just like, you know, scapegoat. I think most of the, like, the kids that I hang out with are cool, geeky hacker types that so they understand, but, like, you know, then there's, you know, my mom and everybody else who kind of just, like, you know, why would they have any reason to believe anything other than he's a total scumbag who, you know, like, war games, you know, the hacking. Oh, that guy! Didn't he break into, like, massive computer systems? Yeah, he's not accused of selling information, he's not accused of destroying the computers, he's just accused of copying some files. Oh, Three and a half years in prison for that. How does yeah, that sound? Cool. Wow, all right, great. It's crazy. Ready to vote? Oh, you're an activist too, huh? Could you imagine if somebody made a film about you and they get, they get this totally evil kind of guy to play you and, you know, just take everything that you ever did and make you look like you're really terrible? Oh, and look, there he is cheating on a crossword puzzle, too. Oh, that guy. <laughs> Many interesting items of relating to Telegraph Street. The street scene, we're in the best place for street scene material. We threw on the street scene. We've got a paper, newspaper. We've got a novel. We've got documentary counters, we've got nine counters, nine years, man. We're like, what system in is going to have dot slash in their path before, like, user loper bin? I mean, it was kind of cool. It was, like, about using SUID and making a script called LS and keeping it in your home directory mm -hmm. and then creating a, a, a file with escape characters and being pretending to be a lamer and being like, hi, I need help deleting this. And then when they go in there and do an LS, but what system in is going to have LS, uh, dot slash in their path before user local bin? I don't know, man. Some of those hackers. And I'm on my computer, send me all this shit all at once. Like what? And it just, I don't know, just like all these messages. Hey, that makes my computer like Are you on AOL out. by any chance? No. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> We've really been bending over backwards to help this guy, and he's only one point away from disqualification. Well, let's do an easy one, the film. Everyone hates the film, right? I mean, when I read the, the screenplay, I was mostly just disappointed because it seemed like a crummy screenplay. There we go. He's back in the running. With one clip to go, the best Markov could hope for was a tie. So I gave him a chance to show some humanity. I asked him to help us help Kevin and sign a petition to get him released from prison and end the nightmare. He didn't want to sign the petition, but he had a better idea. Well, you know, if you could pass a message to Kevin and say if he'd be willing to sit down and talk, talk to me before his trial, um, I would love to do a piece. Um, and I think that's perfectly fair. If nothing else, you gotta give the guy credit for trying. More than a decade of writing about Kevin, and he still had yet to talk to him. Now it was time for our last corporate visit, Novell, who claimed Kevin cost them more than $75 million. We went to their corporate headquarters in Provo, Utah. Okay, now the road says 180 East. All right, we want 122 East, 1700 South. It's like some sort of locker combination. Um, Okay, here we are. Is there somebody in charge of security, maybe? Might, uh, um, I know the person in charge of security is uh, what's the name? Tom Christensen or something like that. Okay. He's just brand new. Wow, check that out. This guy is so worried about us seeing his name tag that he went through this whole acrobatic act to turn it over nice and casual-like. 
But in the end, it was just like everywhere else. Nobody was allowed to say anything. But at least we tried. Hey, pal, look down. Whoops. So the last corporate door had been closed on us. And now we had one last task, to head across the country and stop the film. We knew it wouldn't work. We always knew it wouldn't work. But that's what hacking has been about from the beginning, doing things that you knew wouldn't work just because you had to. And trying to ignore the fucked up shit that was happening to your friends and trying not to feel bad when you couldn't change a thing. As we drove from state to state, I thought of how bad it could get, how bad it had already gotten. I remembered what they do to people who piss them off. I remembered what they did to Bernie. The Bernie S case, as far as I'm concerned, got blown out of proportion by a lot of things. It got blown out of proportion by the prosecution. Who knew what exactly he had done and their representation of it was almost to make him look like the guy who blew up the Murrah Federal Building. To do that was an incredible leap, but they managed to pass that off. They made uh, Bernie S look like an absolute terrorist. The new statute that my attorney had never heard of and neither had I, that uh, in fact it wasn't even in the law books yet. Um, it, made it makes it a federal felony to possess uh, hardware or software for the modification of telecommunications instruments for the unauthorized access to telecommunications services. It wasn't accused or alleged to have done anything with software or ever cloned a cellular phone or anything of that nature. Just the mere possession of these things now constituted a federal felony according to this new statute. The judge ordered me held without bail based on the fact that uh, books, in fact, I had, uh, I think I had two books in my home on how uh, fireworks, uh, explosives are made, that, sort of, that stuff is fascinating. I, mean, I had about 2,000 books in my personal library. What little media attention the case got made Bernie look like a dangerous maniac, but he had never stolen anything, not even a phone call. Everything they used to make him look like a terrorist was something he had legitimately obtained. But when the Secret Service wants you in prison, nobody asks them why, not even a judge. Your Honor, um, when we initially searched Mr. Cummings' house, uh, federal agents discovered a, a substance they believed to be C4 plastic explosives. And while uh, upon later analysis it, it, it turned up not to be C4, the fact that it might have been concerned us greatly. And based on that, uh, we would recommend for a, a, more, a stronger sentence. And the judge didn't even blink at that sort of a thing. Then the prosecutor made a startling revelation to Bernie's lawyer. She had told him she was under a lot of pressure to prosecute this case from, by the Secret Service. And, uh, and that, in fact, the real reason, and that's a quote, the real reason, end quote, Ed is in jail, uh, was not because of crystals or software or anything like that. It was because uh, of other things that they found in my house. Um, namely, um, surveillance photographs of undercover Secret Service agents. So I made these, these photos available at the 2600 meeting, and uh, it apparently was a coincidence, because I didn't call them, but the local Fox uh, television affiliate, uh, Fox 29 in Philadelphia, their news division, showed up at the meeting. Most are between their mid-teens to late 20s. They gather every Friday night at 30th Street Station for all to see. It's called the 2600 meeting, named after a telephone frequency. And meetings like these are advertised in a high-tech magazine you can buy at a bookstore. Some hackers call themselves fighters for the freedom of information. The U.S. Secret Service monitors some hackers, but hackers say it should be the other way around. And in this photograph here, the Secret Service agent is picking his nose. Um, the Secret Service didn't find a hammer. Um, not only did they have some of their agents' covers blown, but uh, they didn't, you know, picking their noses on uh, major market television news stations. So, uh, Oh, we all thought that was amusing, and um, until uh, you know, I was in federal prison, and I found out that that was the real reason I was locked up was because of that. For a year and a half, Bernie was bounced around maximum security prisons throughout Pennsylvania. I think they got tired of me filing these appeals, because I uh, I found myself in handcuffs and shackles, and taken up to uh, uh, Lehigh County Prison, which had a reputation amongst prisoners that I talked to over the past year um, as probably one of the roughest prisons in Pennsylvania. Within a day, Bernie was attacked. He punched me in the, uh, in the mouth and I went down. He's a big guy, probably weighed like 220 pounds. 
Um, and I think it turns out later he was on he was on drugs, uh, coming down off a crack or something. But anyway, I went down and uh, he uh, started to kick me in the head, and I put my arm up to block his kick, and it broke my arm also. After bleeding for hours, Bernie was finally taken to the hospital, but the authorities refused to let him contact his relatives. The hospital wanted me to sign this waiver, sign this, you know, wherever you go into surgery, you have to sign this thing saying that, you know, you understand all the risks involved. I refused to sign the paper. I said, not until I get, it, get a hold of my uncle, at least let somebody in my family know what's going on. And uh, the prison officials went bananas that I wouldn't sign this waiver. There's a, there was a liability for them that I, not, that I wasn't getting medical treatment. Um, and it was, I was severely injured and they needed to operate on me right away. We got all the way up to the warden of this place. And, uh, and my uncle was a known quantity, a known person in the community. He'd been president of the city council for years. I mean, they all knew who he was. He wasn't someone who was going to run down there and try to spring me out of, out of the hospital. Meanwhile, I'm, I was handcuffed and shackled to the, uh, to the hospital bed, which was ridiculous. I didn't feel like going anywhere. I was, I was in bad shape. So uh, with a guard sitting there with a gun, making sure that I didn't like break the handcuffs and run away, I was denied antibiotics for two days. I was denied any painkillers at all, not even aspirin, which I couldn't take because my teeth were completely wired shut. And I was in probably the most excruciating pain that I've ever, I know that I've ever had, but more than I could ever imagine, having multiple fractures. And, and uh, it, was, it was like being in, in altered states of consciousness, this, this much pain. And uh, they weren't even bringing me food I could eat. They were bringing me solid food, which I couldn't eat because my jaw was wired shut. I was getting to the point where I really, they were, I was starting to feel like I don't care anymore. I'm just, I was just really, I was really feeling like I give up. I just lose my will to go ahead. I was able to get a phone call out the next day, tell people where I was, what was going on. And that really, I think, is when a, a, a major telephone campaign, internet, crusade started getting gaining momentum. Uh, we had like state representatives getting called, I mean like major politicians getting calls and, and calling the prison saying, what's with this? What's this generating all the publicity for? Finally, I think the, re the prison and the judge realized they didn't need this publicity. They wanted to get this thing over with and, and wash their hands of it. So the judge uh, uh, signed an order to have me released on a medical furlough, which the guards had never even heard of before. They said, what the hell is that? We have people who die in here. We don't even let them out. So this was an unusual uh, thing. I'm convinced that uh, that all the publicity generated by, uh, well, 2600 Magazine, the inter their website, um, uh, the radio interviews. I even forgot to mention that. I'd been uh, repeatedly interviewed on uh, WBII, BAI's Off the Hook show with Emmanuel Goldstein. And people were following this case from, from the beginning. And it was generating a lot of attention that way as well. I got letters, I, mean, I got hundreds of letters. We had gotten them out, but it sure didn't feel like a victory. And the scars were permanent. They had to put a, uh, the surgeons mounted a, uh, a titanium uh, bar in my, uh, in my arm. I don't know if you can uh, see it or not. There's a nice uh, scar from here to here where, this, uh, where they put this titanium bar in and uh, seven stainless steel screws. This is how much my arm opens now. That's, that's it. I, that's my full range of motion on my left arm, unlike my good arm, which straightens out. Anyway, that's what I got. My jaw doesn't open as much uh, as it used to. If I'm trying to bite an apple, I can't get it in like I used to, but I live with it. We crossed the entire country and we're finally closing in on the takedown set, but there was a problem. It seems that the um and the hurricane uh, is making a beeline for the set yeah. at this point in time. In fact, it's estimated that it will reach and destroy the set by sometime tomorrow. And uh, that's, that's something that causes me concern because, you know, it's not like that's something we wanted to have happen. And um, I fear that one of the listeners or one of the uh, subscribers or somebody may have called upon Almighty Allah or, or <laughs> Christ or, or whatever to rain forth upon these people with all kinds of uh, venom. And I'd just like to stress at this point that that's not what we meant to do. That's not exactly how I want things to turn out. 
I fear that, that the takedown people aren't taking this seriously. Um, the, the, if you look at the map, you know, if you look at, at the news reports, you will see the eye of the hurricane. You will see the direction it's heading for. You will see a little dot that indicates takedown being produced there. That is where it is heading. Yep. This is kind of like the scene in Twister, where the rival <laughs> gangs of, of Twister watchers are trying to warn each other, this is the big one. Well, this is the big one. Okay, they, they were looking at this thing, and they saw another hurricane contained within this hurricane. And they say they've never seen that before. And if that's not enough for you, Hurricane Bonnie. Bonnie is the name of Kevin Mitnick's ex-wife. Oh, boy. Now, now that's the, the metaphor just could not be more perfect for me. Of course, we didn't take our own advice and drove straight into the storm. We thought we might be able to get a lot closer to the set if nobody was around. We were right. They seemed to have a real fixation on gun safety in this place. You had to wonder what had happened. We took a little tour of the restricted area past the unguarded guardhouse. The storm passed, and while we were exploring the next day, we made a discovery. And they all want free Kevin stickers. The whole crew wants free I will send, if you give me some, I'll send them to them. They will put them on their cars. Was it really this easy? Have we stumbled upon where the takedown people were staying through our own bumper sticker? Yeah, Mr. Wong. Oh, right, Russell nine. Wong. Yeah. Yeah. He's in number nine. Is he still here? I think he is. The hotel receptionist went out of her way to tell us where everyone was staying. And while the guy playing Shimamura wasn't in, we found one of the producers who promised us an interview that coming Sunday. The place was swarming with celebrities like cast members from Dawson's Creek engaging in decadent behavior. We wandered around town, taking in the carnage from Bonnie, seeing the desperate people. We witnessed civilization brought to a standstill. Roads were closed. Power was out. Trees were knocked down. But it didn't matter. We were going to finally talk to the takedown people. But there was nothing to do. The computer store was closed. We had four days to kill, so we drove all the way to Raleigh to see the town where Kevin Mitnick was captured. Those were the cellular towers where Markov and Shimamura tracked Kevin's signal, and this was the apartment complex it led them to. And this was Kevin's actual apartment. You have a computer yourself? Yeah. Be careful. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Okay. We found some takedown crew members back in Wilmington where the power was finally restored. You have to remember that, like, film is usually for fourth grade mentality. Skeet is definitely, he's a, he's a great actor, and he's... Yeah. He's the most natural actor, he's so Kevin's him. lucky that yeah, he's, Kevin. he's got, I mean, and he's very charismatic. You can, there's nothing you can do to Skeet Ulrich that makes him uncharismatic. So that's kind of, I mean, from your side, it's kind of a, he's lucky, you know? I promised to tell Kevin how lucky he was next time I talked to him. But now it was time for our interview. We had been in North Carolina for five days. But something was wrong. Miramax had changed their mind, and now they didn't want to talk to us. So we staged an impromptu protest outside the studio, and as we were leaving, destiny hit us again. This time we wouldn't let them escape. We drove next door and waited for them to leave. Okay, there he goes. You got him? Yeah. Alright. Off he goes. He took a while to really And this is the real takedown. We had two cars on our side. We would outflank them, chase them, ambush them, whatever it took. I wish I didn't have these goddamn running lights. Close enough, go. For six weeks we had been trying to talk to these people, and we hadn't even gotten a phone call back. So this is what it came down to a cat-and-mouse game in the streets of Wilmington. They didn't know who they were dealing with. 
He's making a U-turn. Oh, he's making a U-turn, that motherfucker. Oh, God. Oh, he's getting gas. Oh, man, there's a boat in the way. Now. Only eight minutes left Dude, on this tape. there's a boat in the way. What do we do now? Oh, this is just great. This is just so typical North Carolina-ish. Fucking boat blocking us on a street. It's right there. Oh, man. This guy's good. This guy's real good. With They made a U-turn, went to the gas station. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> did they did they then go that way? They did go that way. After they made the U-turn, they left the gas station, went that way. Huh? They went that way. When? Right after the gas station? A few minutes ago. I thought I waited. I thought maybe you'd come by. So they're headed that way. Where? So let's go. Let's go. Where are we gonna go? Forward. Even if we go forward at, at maximum warp, we can't catch them because they're doing the same thing. Let's face it, guys. We lost. They beat us. They beat us. They beat us. Shakes? Yeah. Shakes. There's always the outside chance they'll get a shake too. We had failed. We never found Shimamura. We never got to talk to the takedown people and we never got past the lobby in any of the corporations we visited. Worst of all, Kevin was still in prison. 1999 saw the Free Kevin movement reach a fever pitch. The media wouldn't cover it, so the message went out over hacked web pages. And for the first time, hackers marched in the streets in 15 cities all over the world, even overseas in England and Russia. It was an amazing spectacle, and more people learned about Kevin's plight than ever before. Even though Kevin Mitnick saw his fourth year behind bars come and go, we felt like we were getting somewhere. Excuse me. What are you doing? And, in the end, Kevin did what he had to do to avoid spending the next ten years behind bars. Watching Southern California's CBS 2 News at 6.30. Good evening once again. I'm Gretchen Carr. and Martin is off tonight. And I'm Michael talking up front at 6.30, a guilty plea by notorious computer hacker Kevin David Mitnick. Juan Fernandez joins us live right now from the federal courthouse in downtown Los Angeles. Juan? Well, Mike, he was the first computer hacker to make it to the FBI's most wanted list. And after a very lengthy battle with the federal government, the 35-year-old man from the San Fernando Valley comes clean. His computer crimes apparently cost companies millions of dollars, although Kevin Mitnick never admitted to them until today, ending a four-year battle with the federal government. This is a very serious crime, and that the federal government takes this crime very seriously, and we will prosecute hackers, particularly when they cause significant amounts of damage. Mitnick now faces 46 months in jail. He's already served eight months, and according to his attorney, with good behavior, Mitnick might only have to serve one more year. Well, Mitnick will pay for his crimes for the rest of his life, although his attorneys say he has no money to pay restitution to the companies that he hacked, that doesn't mean that they won't go after him later. It was as if we hadn't said a word. I pray that they never wind up in the legal system. I pray that nobody does, but the thing is, is that if, if they do, right now the way it stands, the cards are stacked against them. It's not about fairness, it's just about the way the legal game is played. Um, it seems crazy to even bring up the O.J. Simpson case, because there's no comparison here. But here's a case where a defendant had an, un, basically an unlimited budget, and look what that legal team accomplished. I'm not saying you need a lot of money to get off for something you did. I'm saying it doesn't matter whether you did it or not. It's The case, the legal system, the justice system isn't about what you did or what you didn't do. It's a, It's about... Either the government's going to win the case or you're going to win the case. That's all that matters in the case. I'm not saying it's all that matters morally. I'm just saying in the, in the court system, that's all that matters. The prosecutors will do whatever they, whatever they can do, spend whatever money they can to win a case, and you have to do the same thing or you will lose. You know, this is no longer about what the law allows or doesn't allow. This is about how do you make it as difficult as possible for the defendants to get them to roll over or cop a plea has nothing to do with justice anymore. God help you if you get stuck in that system because it's, it's, 
it's very easy to get in and it's almost impossible to get out unscathed um, because uh, you're up you're up against an adversary that has everything going for it except maybe the truth and unfortunately that doesn't count for much so <laughs> that's the way it is <laughs> if the legal community doesn't wake up shortly we're going to have laws we're going to have more people locked up than we know what to do with a lot of them are going to be kids unfortunately no, I'm an adamant son. I was raised to be strong, and mama told me be a thug. Since the day I was born, I came up out the gut. I never changed my style. Got for real about my papers, cause the game was well. And the fame was a plot to try to change me. And it was strange as nobody knew my name for a day. Now the whole world's calling me a killer. All I ever did was try to reach the kids with the real all the time I was falling. Never heard my friends calling. Couldn't stop myself from falling. The mauling shit's getting seasoned. Believe it, let them take what you need, but don't be A lot of them are going to be kids. huge controversy that went on until now. I, but there I weren't saw. any more stories in the New York Times about it. Um, well, I mean, what, what would you think that we should have reported? I mean, um... Okay.
I appreciate everybody taking the time to view this film, which was a tremendous effort on the part of Emmanuel Goldstein and everyone on, 20, on the 2600 staff. And I want to offer my uh, sincere appreciation, gratitude for the tremendous moral support that everyone has given me throughout this uh, five-year-old ordeal.